David Bizod here, and you, my friends, are watching Paratech 10. If you can give me 20 or 30 minutes of your time, I promise you that you will get the benefits of my now 60 plus years of working on and doing development projects on high performance and race engines. So, in just 20 minutes, you can pack in some knowledge that will be something that I may have spent years getting. So it's a good shortcut to methods for making more power. Let me remind you, this is the channel where we try to absolutely minimize the BS and we try to straighten out misconceptions and things like this. We also reveal the big time BSers and poor products. This is something very few other video channels do. And some do, but very few others. And when we have, uh, and we don't really lay into those companies that have something that's kind of indifferent, but not that good. We go for the throat on those companies or individuals who are so far off reality that you need to be told. Now this episode is something of a special. It's number 100. Let's talk about this 100th issue first. Here, I really would like to thank almost 39,000 people who have subscribed in just eight months. Now, I know there's channels that have gone much, much more than that, but you won't find many in the automotive line. Only those uh, channels that have either been going for a few years or have managed to get some big backing or the recommendations from some big backers. But uh, we're getting there. And here's the nice thing. Our number of subscribers per month is slowly increasing. That's good. I just wonder if we can make 50,000 before Christmas. Now, let me ask a favor here. All you subscribers that are out there that are willing to support our cause here, why not tell all your buddies about this channel, especially you guys who are homing in on the Mustang project. I am trying to get Mustang users to get on this channel. And for why? There are so many things out there that they are buying that they may not need or actually don't work as good as they all think they do. And here's one. I think there's a lot of air boxes out there that don't deliver like you might think they do. And the reason they may show up making a little more horsepower on a dyno test is that that's the way the cookie fell because the cars that are being tested on aren't that consistent with their dyno figures. A little cool down and a, a cool intake system that hasn't been preheated by previous runs, and boom, seven or eight horsepower more. I'm going to show you, you Mustang guys, how to check whether your engine, your turbo engine, needs more or intake flow. Now I said turbo motor. I'm going to show you on an EcoBoost Mustang. But this same technique can be applied to any Mustang. And I'll make a bet now that none of those cold air intakes from the factory are as bad as you think. Now it could be proved wrong, but I, I'm not going to just claim this is so. We're going to test it for sure. And I'll tell you what you need to test it. Some long, thin plastic tube, a four-foot ruler, a piece of two-by-four, and some staples, and you're in business. Doesn't sound like too much to find, does it? We'll do that in another episode on the Mustang. Now, okay, I've thanked everybody for the... Uh, uh, the subscriptions. Let me see what the next thing is on my list here. Number uh, two. 
Oh yeah, a real quickie here. Number two. Yes, guys, I'm still working on the 318 stuff. I have not had a very good time since I had my throat surgery here, although it's healing very well. I cannot believe the effects it had on my rate of recuperation. Normally I recuperate and I'm like better in half the time of average. Here, this was what seemed to me to be a relatively simple operation, has kept me laid low for nearly a month now. I am still not over it. And they said, oh, two weeks and you'll be okay. No. Yesterday was four weeks and I'm still having a problem getting to sleep, etc. from it. And I'm still taking painkillers once in a while. But anyway, enough of that. The 318 project is still moving along. I'm still working on the rods and crank. So look out for that down the road. Okay, I've just th thought of something I didn't put a number on, right? So I am going to name this uh, point number, uh, what would you say, two and a half. So it'll go in there. I am hoping very shortly, with the assistance of my good friend Randy Edwards, to start our weekly evening broadcast once a week on performance stuff. Let me introduce Randy to you briefly, but I'll do it properly when we start, which may be about the end of August. Randy Edwards, his son John, was Jeff Gordon's PR guy and also a close friend. Randy, who is now in a very tr at a very trim 87 years old, has met so many big names in motorsport and he's an ex-racer himself, that he has got stories which are unbelievably, uh, how shall I say, interest capturing. Um, some of them, it's a good job the drivers have, or the, how shall I say, the people concerned have passed away because they may be a bit embarrassed about some of these things. But anyway, look out for this. So we will run this show, it will be Andy, Andy Wood, Randy, Randy Edwards, and David, that's me. And we will invite guests. Now, Randy has a lot of guests, people that you will know, and a lot that are well known in the industry that you won't know. So, watch out for that. Uh, also, what we may try, and I don't know if this is going to work or not, we may try just uh, advertising one particular part on the show if it's available and it's a good bargain we'll just do it impromptu so that's something to look forward to so as you can see and hear there's quite a lot going on here and and unfortunately i am short of time on it but things are getting better with andy's and randy's help we certainly will get more done uh, number three. Uh, okay, the cold air intakes was number three. Number four. Here's a really popular, uh, uh, how shall I say, test uh, item versus test item. It is carburetors versus fuel injection. Which is best? Well, I need to. Um, give you an idea here of what it is that I'm trying to impress on you. Testing the, a fuel injection against a carburetor is not quite as easy as you may think it is. Now, when we test fuel injection versus carburetor, the carburetor on a like or similar CFM rating usually beats the fuel injection. I've seen the fuel injection fall short by as much as 20 horsepower on a 500 horse engine. No, on a 400 horse engine. Now, where's that 20 horsepower gone? Um, and I'm talking about almost any type of fuel injection. I've tested um, injection to, uh, at the port 
uh, in both um, continuous flow and uh, batch flow and time injection. There isn't much difference. Now, I'm not including emissions here, but that's injection versus injection. Uh, let me tell you about a test I did many years ago with a, fuel in a throttle body fuel injection system versus a carburetor. And I think this was on about, oh, about a 450 horse engine. Uh, and the uh, flow of the fuel injection um, uh, throttle body was about 800 CFM compared with about 750 for the carburetor. Now, the carburetor was on a uh, Victor Junior, it was on a 350 Chevy, and it made best power uh, with a spacer on, a, a, a two inch spacer. We took the carburetor off and we put the fuel throttle body fuel injection on, and lo and behold, it was about 15 foot pounds and about 20 horsepower down. So, I had this feeling that the fuel was coming out of the throttle body too fast. Sounds like an often left field deal, doesn't it? Anyway, what I did was I put a second two inch spacer on this and now the fuel injection throttle body is now a four inch spacer, That's, you know, what this. What happened? Picked up some power. So I put another one on. So now we got six inches of spacer. Dino tested it, picked up some power. We ended up with six spacers on underneath that throttle body injection. And with six spacers on, it almost matched the power of the carburetor. I mean, we're talking about two or three horsepower behind and two or three foot pounds, that's all. Now, took the fuel injection off that stack of spacers, put the carburetor on, right? And it made almost identical power to the fuel injection. So what does this tell us? It tells us that we, we probably don't have the atomization curve on what's discharged into the air correct. The carburetor has a better one than the fuel injected one. So how can we deal with this? Well, one of the ways we can deal with it is, as I said, great big stack of, of uh, uh, spacers. Very inconvenient. You can't go driving down the road with a foot and a half of spacers and, car and injection body sticking out through the hood. So, what's the cure for it? Well, it seems like nobody's got a cure, but I might have, and I'm going to be working with, I, th I don't know, uh, could be one of the well-known fuel injection companies, right? Um, I've discussed this with one and they think it's probably a workable idea, but I'll tell you that down the road. I'm going to be testing that, hopefully, on that engine I've got there. Uh, now, what I've said only applies to throttle body. That's where you got... Uh, the um, fuel going into the engine about the same place. Now, let's go back to uh, the fuel injection that we used on race engines. Almost always, the fuel was better off injected just before the air horn. So here we have a big air filter and it's going out and drawing air from a cold source and the fuel injection is aimed down the cylinder. On the ports, there is the injection nozzles that run the car up to about a third of its power. After that, these injectors start coming in and they are probably somewhere like this far from the intake valve. That's where they make the most power. Now, it's not a good idea to just point the injectors down the aim them straight down. When the air comes in at high RPM, you know, you're turning 10,000 RPM on your two liter Cosworth, right? There's a hurricane going past those injectors. Number one injector 
will probably go down number three port. So what you've got to do is you've got to offset them and even have them lead. Now that takes a bit of fiddling around to see where it's going to be best, but that's the way to do it. Now on the F1 cars, right, the induction length is not necessarily after you've had a, uh, not necessarily a plenum and a length into that, you know, a Helmholtz resonator, they're injecting direct into the trumpets up here. You'll notice that's where the injection is, right? That's because it makes the most power. Right, so what we've got to do here with this EFI versus carb spit is to find out if the droplet size curve can be modified so that it gives a carburetor type curve, and that is a certain amount of vapor is involved early on in the injection cycle. That's how we've got to get it going. It's got to have a very fine atomization early on so that the small droplets that may start or what you want vaporize on the valve. 15% of what goes in the cylinder needs to be in vapor form to get good combustion. Now, that was, let's go to number five. Number five is all about setting up your engine. Do you do the carburetor first or the timing first? Now, I'm not going to pick on any particular big time channel here. But I have seen guys who are well-educated engine builders do this the wrong way. We'll set the timing up and then we'll do the mixture. No. Wrong way. You should set the mixture up and your first move is to have the timing slightly retarded on where you know it's or where you suspect it's going to be. I would say you need to put the timing about four degrees before where you think it's going to be. This is how I do it. Then you set up the mixture. We set the mixture up first because the flame speed is greatly affected by how much extra fuel or lack of extra fuel is in the mixture. For instance, if you had a very weak mixture, the cylinder will burn very, very slowly. And I, I can say very slowly. At idle, it may only burn at walking pace. And you may need as much as 55 degrees of timing to get the most economical idle on your fuel input. Vacuum won't be very much, but it will idle and be very low fuel consumption. Now, when the mixture's right, uh, or about from where the, it's chemically correct, that's called the stoichiometric mixture, that's usually around about 14 point something to one, to about 12.8, 13 to one, and that's a bit kind of iffy on, depending on the engine. The mixture will burn faster. When it gets over about 12.8, it burns slower and slower and slower. Now, if you set the timing, that means it could be wrong for almost all of those mixtures except one that is not where you want the mixture. So, what you do first is get the best power from the engine possible by getting the mixture right. Guys in those big channels, please note, let me see this done correctly. I mean, you're doing a fine job otherwise, but not here you could be throwing away 20 horsepower. So you get the mixture right first, then you optimize the timing curve. That you do by finding out what it needs at 2000, 2500, 3000 at full power. That's what your mechanical curve is going to be. Now for part throttle, you have to look at what it needs and then what the vacuum is so that when you set now this is good for a, a fuel injected situation. You can set the timing so that at that RPM and that vacuum, it gives this advance. That is the beauty of an electronic timing gear. 
the ideal situation here is to have a carburetor delivering fuel to an electronically controlled ignition system because trying to get this with a vacuum can and a, a mechanical advance is very difficult. And let me give you a tip there. A company that's had extreme amount of experience on this vacuum can mechanical advance deal is Performance Distributors. I'll put the name across the bottom. I've dealt with them forever and a day. And they are very good at taking the spec of your engine and putting the vacuum and mechanical advance characteristics in that your engine requires. When I say very good, I mean very good. To get it perfect, that's going to take a lot more than just that. Now, I've got the facilities to do that, a dyno, a distributor machine, and time to play around. You guys who are building hot rods, let me tell you something about a performance enthusiast. They want instant satisfaction. I'm the same, but I realize you can't always get it. Now tell me if I'm right. Do you guys want to be able to take a part that you've bought, plug it straight into your motor and have it work right off? Yes, of course you do. Me the same. However, all too often I get products which I have to fix. I have fun fixing these products, but sometimes I just resent having to do other people's R&D for them. And, and I think some of you have realized it. But anyway, what's object number six here? Let me just put my glasses on. Object number six, wheel selection. Hands up all of those who think cam selection is difficult. Let me tell you what's difficult. And it puts cam selection, from my point of view, into the shade. Wheel selection. Now, you guys who are following my Mustang build, that's my next, that is my first move, is to change the stock wheels for an option which is better suited to what I'm trying to do. And I'll get to that. I'm doing the wheel thing now. But the point is this. It's a maze of misconceptions and opportunities to make erroneous choices. Now this is not because you guys are ignorant or anything like that. It's that finding this information and utilizing it is not as simple as you would think. Now I have not bought a set of wheels specifically for a performance application for years. The last time I bought performance wheels it was a race wheel or nothing. Budget was not a constraint. If I wanted to buy a set of magnesium wheels, somewhere I found the money for it. Why? Because they were the lightest wheels with the least moment of inertia. They also emptied my bank balance for a month. Now, a lot of you guys have your Mustangs. It's a fun machine for the road. Yes, sure, you want to put on big wheels and tires because you, A, it looks good. B, there's an opportunity there to improve the car's handling, road holding and braking. Some of you may have to put on big wheels because you need to clear a bigger disc and caliper. Right? All of these things cloud the issue. So in my Mustang wheel selection, I'm going to hopefully show you all that's involved and present you, or most of you, especially the Mustang guys, with a simple solution to both entry level and race level and you won't believe the hassle that I'm going to save you. Now, have I got anything else to say here? Uh, I don't think so. I think that's about it for now. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to start, I think it will be number six of the Paratech 10 dyno tested parts sell off. So look for that real shortly. Thank you for watching. Thank you.